Astronauts spot a plane that accidentally ended up in space, streaking past their window at impossible speeds. When they look closer, they realize this isn't any ordinary aircraft. What happens next reveals one of the most dangerous missions ever flown at the edge of space. April 1986. Major Brian Schul gripped the stick of his SR-71 Blackbird as it screamed across the Libyan desert at over 2,000 miles per hour. His wingman, Major Walter Watson, sat four feet behind him, watching the instrument panels light up with warnings. They were flying a bomb damage assessment mission after American F-111s just struck terrorist camps across Libya. The target, Muammar Gaddafi's military installations. But there was a problem and Walt's voice crackled through the intercom. I'm getting missile launch signals. The words hung in the cockpit for a second. Below them, somewhere in that endless stretch of sand, Libyan SAM sites had locked onto their position. Surface to air missiles, capable of Mach 5, were about to turn them into a fireball at 80,000 feet. Most pilots would turn, most pilots would run. Brian Schull was not most pilots. He pushed the throttles forward. This moment, this decision to accelerate into danger rather than run away from it, represented everything the SR-71 Blackbird was designed to do. Yet to understand how this aircraft came to fly at the very edge of space, high enough that astronauts would one day catch glimpses of it streaking through the darkness below them. The story goes back 26 years earlier, to a disaster that changed American intelligence forever. May 1960. Francis Gary Powers was flying his U-2 spy plane over the Soviet Union when a missile tore his aircraft apart. He survived, but the incident was a diplomatic nightmare. The Soviets paraded him on television. The Americans were caught lying about the mission. President Eisenhower was humiliated. The message was clear. The U-2 was too slow and flew too low. America needed something better. So in a secret facility in Burbank, California, a man named Kelly Johnson got a phone call. The CIA had a question. Can you build a plane that flies so high and so fast that nothing on earth can touch it? Johnson's answer changed aviation forever. He called his team at Lockheed Skunk Works, a division so secretive that most employees didn't even know what their colleagues were building. The engineers gathered in a locked room where Johnson drew a shape on the blackboard. It looked like nothing they'd ever seen. Long, sleek, and predatory. We're going to build something that can fly at the edge of space, Johnson told them. Faster than any missile, higher than any interceptor, and we're going to make it invisible to radar. The team stared at the drawing in shock until one engineer gathered up the courage to speak. That's impossible, Johnson smiled. Good. Then no one will expect it. The challenges were immediate and brutal. The plane needed to fly faster than Mach 3, which meant the friction with the atmosphere would heat the airframe to over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Aluminum would melt and steel would buckle. They need something else. Titanium. The problem was that the world's largest supplier of titanium was the Soviet Union, the very country they were trying to spy on. So the CIA set up bogus companies and purchased Soviet titanium through third parties. The Soviets unknowingly provided the material for the plane designed to spy on them. But things weren't all smooth sailing after this. Working with titanium created new nightmares. Regular tools shattered it on contact, and it had to be welded with distilled water because chlorine caused corrosion. At one point, 80% of the delivered titanium was contaminated, and they had to buy more. The engineers invented entirely new manufacturing processes just to make the plane possible. Every weld had to be perfect, every joint precise. A single mistake could mean the difference between success and a pilot burning alive at 80,000 feet. But the biggest innovation wasn't the material, it was the design itself. Johnson created a shape with flattened sides and canted vertical surfaces that deflected radar away from enemy tracking stations. He added Chinese, sharp edges that run along the fuselage. Aerodynamicists initially disliked them, referring to the design as a Mach 3 Ford trimeter. But testing revealed a surprise. The Chinese created powerful air vortices that boosted lift. What began as a radar evading feature unexpectedly improved performance, and the aircraft became more capable than anyone imagined. 
The aircraft was painted black, not for stealth, but to radiate heat more efficiently, keeping the airframe from melting at extreme speeds. And with that, the Blackbird was born. The first version, called the A-12, made its maiden flight in April 1962 at Area 51, a CIA black project so secret that the pilots carried no identification. If they crashed in enemy territory, the U.S. government would deny they existed. To the delight of the engineers, the A-12 flew higher and faster than anything before it. It worked so well that the Air Force demanded its own version, calling it the SR-71, for strategic reconnaissance. This new plane was longer than the A-12, could carry more fuel, and had two cockpits instead of one. A pilot and a reconnaissance systems officer worked together as a crew, with the pilot flying the aircraft and the RSO operating the cameras, the radar systems, and the electronic countermeasures. They trained together for a year before their first operational mission, building up trust crucial for survival. Flying the SR-71 wasn't like flying anything else. The pilots wore pressure suits identical to those of astronauts to protect them in case the cockpit depressurized at altitude, where the air is so thin that blood would boil without protection. The engines themselves were marvels of engineering. The Pratt & Whitney J-58s behaved like conventional turbojets during takeoff and at subsonic speeds. It wasn't just an engine. It was an integrated propulsion system where every component mattered equally. Standard evasive action for most planes involved turning, diving, and deploying countermeasures. But the SR-71's evasive action was simpler. Accelerate. Just go faster. By the time enemy radar locked on, by the time the missile launched, the Blackbird was already gone. Between 1966 and 1990, the SR-71 flew thousands of missions. North Vietnam fired at it. North Korea fired at it. Soviet submarines tracked it across the Arctic. Libya, Cuba, Nicaragua, Iran, the Middle East, South Africa, and the Falkland Islands. The Blackbird went everywhere, saw everything. Every time missiles were fired, the plane simply outran whatever came its way. Not a single SR-71 was ever shot down by enemy fire in their entire service history. Nearly 4,000 missiles were launched at SR-70s over the years. Not one hits its target. Which brings us back to April 1986. Back to Brian Schul and Walt Watson, streaking across Libya with missiles climbing toward them. Push it up, Walt shouted. Brian's left hand moved instinctively. Both throttles slammed against their stops, full afterburner. The J-58 engines, each producing the power of 40 locomotives, screamed louder. The Mach indicator started climbing, 3.24, 3.31, 3.45. They were approaching a turn in their flight path. If they could hit that turn at this speed, the missiles wouldn't be able to intercept it. The computers guiding those SAMS were calculating where the Blackbird would be. But at these speeds, every fraction of a Mach number changed everything. Brian's eyes were glued to the temperature gauges. He knew the jet would willingly go to speeds that could kill. The turbine inlet temperatures were climbing, but they were not at redline yet. The cooler air at altitude was helping. For two days leading up to this mission, they dealt with inlet problems, vibrations, buzzing, the kind of mechanical complaints that made pilots nervous. But now, over hostile territory, with missiles in the air, the inlet door closed flush. The vibrations disappeared, and the jet smoothed out. More launch signals, Walt reported. His voice was tight. Brian didn't respond. He just watched the miles counter counting down to their turn point. Outside his window, Libya stretches endlessly below, a featureless brown sandbox. Somewhere down there, men were watching radar screens, pressing launch buttons, sending missiles up toward them. The Mach indicator passed 3.5. Walt went quiet. They'd both achieved personal speed records. They were in territory they'd never been before. And at this altitude, at this speed, they were not flying through air anymore. They were skimming the edge of space itself. The atmosphere up here was so thin that the stars were visible even in daylight. The sky above them transitioned from blue to black, and they watched in awe as the curvature of the Earth became clearly visible on the horizon. Brian's eyes opened wide with an awe, and Walt gasped. For a split second, the world went still. This was the moment that astronauts already in space on a separate mission 
saw a strange sight whiz past them below, reporting it back to their mission support team. Then they looked closer, and as you can image, were completely shocked to see that it was, in fact, a plane. This was space. How had a plane accidentally ended up here? What they didn't know was that the SR-71 wasn't really an airplane at this altitude. It was something else. Something between an aircraft and a spacecraft. The engines were functioning more like rockets than jets. They were in a realm where only spacecraft normally operate. The difference is that Brian and Walt would have to come back down and land on a runway. Then just like that, Brian and Walt snapped back to reality. They hit the turn. Brian felt his body press into the seat as the nose swung away from Libya. The G-forces pushed through his pressure suit. Behind them, missiles were following their ballistic arcs, burning through the last of their fuel, trying desperately to catch up. They couldn't, and the Blackbird pulled away. They screamed past Tripoli, leaving a parting sonic boom that rattled windows across the city. In seconds, the Mediterranean spread out below them, blue water replacing brown sand. Walt's voice came through. Calmer now. Deaf panel is quiet. Brian glanced down, his left hand still full forward, both throttles against the stops. The mock indicator showed numbers that seemed impossible, numbers that shouldn't exist. 3.5 plus, time to slow down. Brian pulled the throttles back to their minimum afterburner. The jet didn't respond. She was still accelerating. For a few heartbeats, the old girl just sat out there at high mock. Then, slowly, like she was disappointed the fun was over, she began to decelerate. They were supposed to hit a tanker over Gibraltar for refueling, but they pass over it going 400 knots too fast. The tanker crew reported seeing them flash by overhead like a meteor. Brian eventually pulled the throttles to idle just south of Sicily, but the Blackbird's momentum carried them far past their planned refueling point. The plane was flying at an incredible speed of a mile every 1.6 seconds. It took time to slow down from that kind of speed. Back at RAF Mildenhall, the ground crew swarmed the jet checking for damage, looking for anything that might have been stressed beyond limits. Brian climbed down from the cockpit, his pressure suit soaked with sweat. Walt emerged behind him, shaking his head. How fast were we really going? Walt asked. Brian looked at the maintenance chief. You probably don't want to know. <laughs> the chief looked at the heat discoloration on the fuselage. The titanium skin showed stress patterns that shouldn't be there. Sir. What exactly did you do to my aircraft? Kept her alive, Brian said simply. The film from the cameras was rushed to the intelligence officers. The bomb damage assessment photos turned out to be perfect, rock steady despite the extreme speeds. Every target was clearly documented, making the mission a complete success. But there was something else in the photos, something the intelligence analysts didn't expect. When they examined the high altitude shots, they saw what looked like cloud formations at impossible altitudes. Then they realized what they were looking at. The contrails from the missiles that chased the SR-71, frozen in the photos and falling away far below the Blackbird's flight path. The plane that the astronauts spotted, which accidentally ended up in space, wasn't an accident at all. It was all down to engineering, thanks to titanium, determination, and two men willing to bet their lives on a machine that could outrun physics itself. It was Kelly Johnson's vision, brought to life by hundreds of engineers who invented new ways to build aircraft. It was test pilots who pushed boundaries they couldn't see. The SR-71 served six presidents and protected America for a quarter century. It flew over every hotspot on the planet. It kept watch over Soviet nuclear submarines and mobile missile sites. It tracked troop movements and military installations. And every time someone tried to shoot it down, it simply accelerated and left them behind. The plane retired in 1999, replaced by satellites and drones that could provide instant intelligence without risking pilots. But no crewed aircraft has ever matched what the Blackbird could do. The speed records still stand. The altitude records still stand. And somewhere in the stories pilots tell, there's Brian Schull and Walt Watson, pushing past Mach 3.5 over Libya, racing missiles at the edge of space. What the astronauts had seen was the SR-71 Blackbird pushing beyond every limit it was designed for. Brian Schul and Walt Watson returned home safely that day, having flown faster than any SR-71 crew before them. What do you think made the SR-71 so effective? Would you have trusted your life to a plane flying at the edge of space? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.